very welcome at the evening highlight panel, um, uh, which is closing for today, but not for the whole of the conference. As I've already mentioned, uh, the host of tonight's panel, Klaus Legevi, uh, has written an article by the impressive title, How to Get Rid of Autocrats, which might be of interest for multiple people. It, this is back in headline on Eurozine. It's a couple uh, months old. It's actually one month old. Please go and read it on Eurozine.com along with uh, other articles which are all linked from today's, yesterday's and tomorrow's speakers in the live stream um, article. And now I give the floor to Klaus Legevi and his invitees whom he is going to address. Very welcome. Thank you very much for the ad and for having me here, having us here. I think um, I don't know if you know uh, Venice, the Ponte Sospiri, and there's uh, this indicated, uh, lasciate andare ogni speranza, let all hope go. Well, this was my feeling after the last panel. Uh, but there is still hope, there is still hope, um, and I think uh, we have to represent hope in this uh, conference now, because there, something can be done against autocrats. Let me um, introduce myself. I'm Klaus Legevi, a political scientist, uh, and I will introduce uh, our great speakers here. Um, let me read first a quote. Protest is when I say that and that doesn't suit me. Resistance is when I make sure that what does not suit me no longer happens. Protest is when I say I'm not part of it anymore. Resistance is when I make sure that everyone else does not join. It's a quote, and it's a dangerous one, it's a toxic one, by Ulrike Meinhof in 1966, when she was still a hero of the rebellion. Her conclusion was imported from a panel or a teach-in, as we said at the time, was the Black Panthers in Berlin. Protest is when I say that and that doesn't suit me. Resistance is when I make sure that what doesn't suit me no longer happens. And it was dangerous because it served as a basis for her building the, the, the Red Army fraction. And it was toxic because it was followed by a verdict a couple of months later, of course we will shoot. But nevertheless, it's an acceptable definition of resistance and seems to be quite topical in these days. But we will not continue with Ulrike Meinhof. We will continue with our panel. Um, in our evening session, we have, forgive me, to forget 89 for a moment, forget 89 for a moment, and develop Geistesgegenwart, as Karl Schlögel said, a presence of mind. And indeed, as he also said, a thinking without banister without these prescriptive lessons of older resistance moving during the 60s and 70s and around 89. I think we have to leave the comfort zone. Uh, I remind you that two days ago, the council, city council of Dresden has proclaimed an anti-Nazi emergency. Wow. An anti-Nazi emergency in Dresden, one of the places of the revolution in 89. We all have not just to interpret the world, we also have to do something and change it. In, all, in the US, all kind of movements, particularly of young and youngest people, desperately try to prevent another presidential term of the crook in the White House. In my view, three main questions arise. The relation between protest movements and parliamentary forces. Two, the relationship to representative democracy and coalition building in general and the European impact and outreach of all this, because we are a European network here. And we are privileged tonight to have three representatives of very successful protests and resistance movements in Europe with us. Elena Marshall from Fridays for, for a Future in Germany, Rado Vanku from Sibiu, Romania, and Dora Papp from Hungary, Budapest who will present themselves in short statements telling us about their activities in their respective countries and cities now. As you see, um, we have organized an open fishbowl here for older people like me. This is a format where the speakers sit in the center, as we do in the moment, in the center of concentric circles where any member of the audience, that is you, 
can at any time, at any time, occupy this empty chair, the black one, and join us. You can also step in when there is no free chair, meaning that one of us will be giving up the center position. And ideally, but this never happened before, we four will all at a certain moment merge into the public, the audience, and we have a lively discussion still moderated by me, I guess. But that's all. So, Dora, to start with you. Um, we met a couple of months ago in Budapest, had a conversation about the chances of the opposition, particularly in the municipal elections, which have taken place meanwhile. And there, uh, not just a miracle, but something very good happened. The mayor of Budapest is no longer a Fidesz member, it's um, one of the opposition. And you were, in your movement, which you would explain a bit to us, uh, Ahang, you were fighting for this, that this could happen. And this not just happened in Budapest, it also happened in other places in, in Hungary. Whereas still uh, the Fidesz party and uh, Orban have an overwhelming majority of people behind them. But nevertheless, let's talk about success. Let's talk about hope. Let's talk about what can be done. So what has been done that in, in this year, 2019, to make this success happen? Yes, thank you uh, for for the invitation. Actually, yes, back back then when we met uh, last year, that was a big question: what is going going on? Uh, what is going to happen? Um, and uh, several weeks after the change in in Budapest and the ray of hope that is is basically uh, a big success for for the opposition right now in Hungary. Uh, of course, I I see more more wide rays of lights or several rays of lights uh, coming to the, to the country and, and not just to the country, but also to, to the region. But um, yeah, I would like to go back a bit when we are talking about Hungary. I'm in a really lucky position that uh, Philip Ter uh, has already uh, mentioned all um, the, well, most most of the disappointing things that that can be mentioned about Hungary, when when we think about Mr. Orban, uh, whose name was mentioned like 20 times this morning and also 10 times uh, the te the session before, uh, I have to say that I don't want to. Um, give him more coverage uh, this evening. But uh, unfortunately, I still live in a, uh, in a country that is uh, ruled by a two-third uh, Fidesz majority. And uh, Budapest is the first crack on the shell of, of uh, illiberalism, illiberalism. And, um, and um, the desperate uh, fight of, of, the, uh, of activism is, is basically uh, come to life or, or can come, come to light uh, no one, uh, from no one. And uh, 2022 is a really big question for, for uh, not just the opposition, but the whole activism in, in uh, Hungary. Because most, most, of the, most of the actual definitions that we use uh, concerning Hungary is illiberal democracy, autocracy, oligarchy, nepotism, corruption, shrinking civic space, uh, I don't know, serious harms and uh, uh, serious harms suffered by uh, uh, the rule of law and democratic institutions. And uh, for example, uh, according to the, um, the 2017 report of the Freedom House, Hungary is only uh, partly free. And I don't even want to think uh, about how many points Hungary is going to lose uh, with the new government-controlled conglomerate funded in 2018. Uh, uniting more than uh, several hundred media outlets, uh, which uh, right now shape information sharing and uh, provides 24-7 propaganda uh, in the air and in the pre uh, printed media in uh, Hungary. I would say partly free is just like uh, getting uh, 44 points of 100 in in the uh, free, uh, Freedom House report. So um, and I and I didn't even mention uh, or or uh, neither neither Mr. Thayer mentioned criminalization of homelessness, uh, dragging marginalized groups uh, like Roma people, women, um, uh, refugees, and asylum seekers in the in the center of attention by by uh, pointing at them as uh, the sources of threats uh, in the country. 
Um, I, I mean the government saying that uh, the country is facing uh, threats by these people and uh, in order to uh, exploit people's hatred and, and lack of solidarity. Uh, and they success successfully transformed it uh, into political power and, and gained uh, economic power while uh, the opposition uh, is captured in a really pitiful um, identity crisis for for a decade now. Um, I'm really I'm really not uh, happy about saying this, but but this is really this is really uh, connected to the uh, crisis of values that um, other panels were were debating about. Um, before that. Um, and uh, before I, I would I would continue painting this back black sheep of Europe even deeper and deeper dark, I would like to say that uh, the movement um, Ahang I was I was working for in the last two two years um, is a digital organizing platform and uh, a platform that stepped out of of other organizations um, and was first in the line uh, that uh, started uh, promote. Uh, digital uh, organizing and political organizing as as uh, the first step towards change uh, which happened with uh, the primaries in budapest um, prim the primaries are not uh, an institution in hungary uh, there is no regulation for that and uh, this platform basically uh, a hung Ahang means the voice, uh, so people's voice. And uh, this platform uh, took, uh, undertook uh, the responsibility of, of organizing this um, um, democratic institution, a brand, brand new democratic institution uh, that the primaries, but we were, we were also um, experiencing with other uh, democratic decision-making uh, procedures. Uh, I could mention, like, the methodology that the platform is using is really, really similar uh, uh, to that what Cam uh, Campact is doing in, in uh, Germany or what Aufstein is doing in Austria or what uh, 38 Degrees is, uh, is doing in, in uh, the UK or Move On in the US. So uh, it's just like knowledge sharing. Basically, these platforms uh, share the methodology uh, we, are work uh, they, uh, we are working with. And... Um, and there was a possibility to continue it also in in uh, Hungary, but um, I also have to mention that that, um, that beyond beyond these uh, definitions, beyond beyond uh, the the ray of hope, uh, we have to see that that is just not enough to make a crack uh, on the shell shell of illiberalism, but we have to change uh, how we think about society. It's it's not just solidarity, it's 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 building a community it really takes building a community around the issues. Um, that that people are uh, that people care about that would change their lives. So it's just not not, not just when they are affected by by certain problems, but how they can show solidarity with each other. And uh, if we turn to if we turn to the notion of eighty nine, I think it's really important. Um, and I think it's really visible here that uh, there are two of us Hungarians uh, right now in this in this conference also. But uh, but I but but I think uh, concerning uh, revolutions in in the revolution in in um, revolutions in Hungary, uh, and and what I think about eighty nine as well is that. Um, and what is the lesson of 89, basically, is that we should stop lying about the, the so-called Venda in Hungary, because uh, there might have been an eco economic change in the country, but thinking about uh, the society uh, culturally, how, how a community is basically uh, should be built up, and how we, think, how we should think about ourselves as a community, what is, the, what is our identity as a, as a nation, these did not change. So basically, um, uh, these are these are and these are really big problems when when we talk about um, changing uh, or the actual role of the opposition, because uh, there is only right wing popul populism in Hungary, which gave um, a, a, um, a fixed um, and really successful narrative for for uh, building up a nation. 
and that's that's where basically Orban's success is, uh, uh, or and that's what the center of Orban's success is as well. Uh, that he is not just a strong leader, but a leader who who really uh, took care of giving. Um, Really simple, uh, really simple message, meth, uh, message that people can identify with. So I think this is really something that that we have to uh, consider, and and also this uh, dissent and um, and also the opposition have to con has to consider that uh, what can they offer beyond fight, and what can they offer beyond um, um, demolishing a a dictatorship. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Radu Vanku is a writer and a professor from Sibiu in Romania, um, and he can tell us some more um, about examples of protest and resistance in Romania. The movement he's active in is a co-founded, I guess, is uh, We See You. We See You. Uh, what does it stand for? Um, well, um, We See You means that uh, the politicians cannot hide behind walls, behind curtains, and do their uh, tricky corruption uh, business as usual because we see them, they cannot hide from us. Sibiu, the city where I come from, has this peculiar architectural characteristic. Uh, the roofs have these kind of air holes in the shape of elongated eyes, and it's a trademark of the city. So. We use the image of the eye in our logo to say, we see you, you cannot hide from us, we know what you are up to. And uh, we started this protest in December 2017, in 11 December, uh, because the whole year has been a year of protests in Romania. In uh, January 2017, the leading party, the governing party, which is a so-called Social Democrat Party, which, by the way, is a... Uh, three words lie or a triple lie. It's not, it's not social because it's, uh, it's uh, populist. It's not democratic, it's kleptocratic. And it's not a party, it's a gathering of mobsters. But nevertheless, okay, let's call it social. But it was part party. of the Socialist International. Uh, it was a very part long. of the Socialist, uh, yes. And it has been kicked out exactly because of corruption, which is a good thing that the social uh, branch of the European Parliament has done. So the governing party was led by a guy, Livio Dragnea, who has been already condemned for uh, uh, election fraud, luckily for him with a suspended sentence. And he had a second trial ongoing for corruption, for abuse of power, abuse in service. And uh, fake jobs, actually. He hired at an institution which was supposed to work for uh, institutionalized children, he hired uh, two persons who were working for his party, but were paid for, for, from public money without uh, working one day, one second in that institution. So it was obvious that he, he was going to be convicted. He put some of his guys to calculate the money stolen from that institution. It, it, was, it was not an enormous sum. It, it was not millions of dollars, it was 200,000 euros, which is quite big, nevertheless. And he intended to pass a law by emergency decree, uh, which to stipulate that anybody stealing less than 200,000 euros from public money is pardoned. I mean, the infraction, the, this crime was taken out of the penal code. And there was a journalist who found out about his intention, because he did not speak publicly about it in the, because there were elections in December 2016, and they never said one word about modifying the laws of justice. And uh, on the contrary, they promised hospitals, they promised eight hospitals. Uh, in two th they were elected in 2016 with this promise. Now it's 2019, no, not one of them has been built yet. They promised uh, highways, not one meter of highways were uh, built. Uh, on the country, they stopped all the constructions of highways and so on. But uh, there was no word about justice. In uh, January 2017, this journalist finds out about the intention, makes them public. The president, Klaus Johannes, who is uh, a liberal, goes to the government meeting and words them, do not pass such a law, because this is obviously anti-European, anti-democratic, it's ridiculous and absurd and outrageous. So do not pass this law. They deny, and in nighttime, they pass the law. 
in night in night time like thieves that was what the street was going to shout uh, in the, because we were all out in the streets immediately tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of romanians uh, at the peak uh, this was in uh, february 1st 2017 in february 5 we were 600,000 people in the streets in Romania shouting against them and asking for the government to resign and for this guy to uh, withdraw. Uh, they did not resign. Uh, we discovered, I mean, there was there were some judges involved in our uh, rebellion, even though the job description of a judge forbids him to go into the streets. But it was too serious, and some of them risked their jobs and came into the streets with us. And one of them observed that uh, there was this 10 days buffer that they forgot, they are also stupid, lucky for us. They forgot this 10-day buffer in the uh, corpus of the emergency decree, which said that the law only enters into force after 10 days. It's a measure usually put into uh, emergency decrees in order to, if there is something misfit or unfit, you have time to, uh, to correct it, yes. So they forgot this buffer there. So we ask that within this 10 days buffer, the emergency decree is withdrawn and they resign. They did half of the job. They withdraw the decree, but they did not resign. And we kept protesting for one year and we saw that they learned how to cope, how to tackle, how to manage the pressure of marching protests, of traditional protests. And we said, we must invent a protest which they cannot manipulate, which they can, don't know how to deal with. And we came with a formula of this um, daily protest, like a Chinese droplet. So uh, 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 we announced that every day at, at noon, we are going to be in Sibiu, in front of the headquarters of the Social Democrat Party, uh, and uh, warn them in this silent protest that we see them. We know that they still work in order to annihilate the rule of law in Romania, because they did not stop with that. They withdraw the emergency decree, but they tried to uh, pass some other laws via the parliament, which to decriminalize whole chapters of the penal code, including, including sexual harassment, for example. I mean, they, they made a sort of inventory of all the guilts, all the legal charges, all the legal problems they had, and they said, okay, we will decriminalize all these things, okay? Uh, so we knew they didn't stop, and uh, we said, okay, we will protest every day at noon in front of your party until you stop, you resign, and we re become a European country with the rule of law active in it. And we have been protesting for 669 days, continually, day by day, until the government fell two weeks ago. And we decided to suspend the protest because now the new government is going hopefully to be installed on Monday. And if they obey, if, if they do what we have asked them, we will leave them alone. If not, we will be back in the streets because now people have learned how to protest, have learned that protests are effective because if you draw international atten attention on them, uh, they respond, the politicians respond, even though they, they pretend not to care. It's their usual weapon to pretend that they don't care about protests. But they do, because international pressure, European pressure is very effective, and this is why Europe for us was not something abstract. It was something very uh, concrete, having a headquarters in Brussels and Strasbourg and so on, and putting pressures, pressure on, on our politicians and forcing them to withdraw uh, their uh, outrageous intentions. It was something very concrete with concrete effects, and this is why we stood in, in, in the streets hoping to become a European country again. It was not an abstraction, it was not something aspirational, it was something that we knew what it is and uh, 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 we wanted to be there. Uh, Helena Marshall um, also knows how to organize a huge protest uh, movement in Germany for a long time. She's from Fridays for Future in Germany, and this is not just a German movement, it's elsewhere. What was your recipe for success, and was, what does stand, uh, Fridays for Future stand for? Um, well, generally, the goal is that effective policy is passed all over the world to combat the climate crisis, because... We are in a place right now that we really do not have time to lose. And I feel like everyone in the movement kind of 
always has like this ticking clock in their head because we have clear planetary boundaries and tipping points. And if we pass them, which will be at around 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, then we can't really do anything about it anymore because then it will be like a ball that has crossed the tip of the mountain and is just rolling downwards. And no matter if, how many emissions we reduce after that, we, we it will just continue rolling downwards. And I feel like... Um, this sense of urgency has just been amplified and um, obviously Greta Thunberg started striking in August of 2018 and this um, through press and through her speech at the COP in um, I think in Poland last year um, she just inspired so so many people including me and I I saw this speech I saw that she was striking um, in Sweden and I kind of said we need to do this in Frankfurt as well. And um, so in December of 2018, so almost a year ago now, we started the first strikes in Frankfurt and we were 30 people the first week. And um, we were striking in, I think, under 20 cities in Germany. So really not that big. Um, but somehow we just kept doing it and we said, OK, let's just do this again next week. We'll see each, all, we'll see each other next Friday. And um, I think, meanwhile, uh, on f today, Saturday, yesterday was the 46th Friday of strikes. Um, we've coordinated internationally. So this movement on the 20th of September was in over 120 countries worldwide. And um, I mean, we've, mobil we've somehow managed to mobilize so many people with our simple message of, we just want a future, which is honestly not a lot to ask and should not not be something we have to ask for but because of the circumstances we've been forced into this situation and we've been forced to act and we've we mobilized 1.4 million people into the streets of germany on the 20th of september and it was no longer just students skipping school but we um campaigned to get as many adults and as many people as possible from all walks of life and from all um uh, P all, all pieces of society to come and strike with us and protest with us and tell the government that they, they are standing behind us and that they support our demands. And um, sadly, on that day in Germany, the Klimapäckchen was announced and that was kind of just a slap, into fa slap in the face of these 1.4 million people protesting because it was, I mean, it has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with the 1.5 degrees agreement that we signed in Paris and um, I guess that's just a sign that we need to keep going and we need to keep protesting and that's why already the next international um, date is set for the 29th of um, November um, to try and put some pressure on the COP25 which is now in Spain as it was just moved shortly and um, yes I mean it just keeps getting more urgent every single week and um, yeah. Um, do you also think about civil uh, ungehorsam, uh, civil resistance, in 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 terms of like uh, extinction rebellion is proposing uh, for a while? I mean, do, is this also an option for you? I mean, skipping school is is already civil disobedience. It was it's a clear break of the rules, which in the first few months was um, very annoying because a lot of people wanted to talk to us about skipping school and not about the climate crisis, which is what we actually want to talk about. <laughs> um, and um, obviously after 10 months of doing that, it's not, it, you won't get the same reaction anymore. It's now kind of, it's very sadly, it's normal now that students are skipping school on Fridays. And um, I think of, there will obviously be new options that we look at. How can we continue to stay in the public eye? How can we continue to put pressure on our politicians? And um, obviously civil dis disobedience is one method to do that. Another method would, which is probably what we're going to be doing a lot on the 29th of November is to be um, as aesthetic as possible. So do very like artful um, forms of protest that um, are just create images that you kind of stop and think and stare at and um, yeah, so I think that, obviously, that's going to happen. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you also need a hand, or?
Um, my question to you is if environmental um, concerns are also, act, uh, also present in, in, in your protest movement, is this an issue or is it an issue for later? Um, yeah, um, I think it's an issue for us in, in the everyday life. Um, but in Hungary, uh, most of the, most of uh, the environmental campaigning is uh, basically occupied by by other organizations like Greenpeace and uh, and uh, Friends of the Earth, and um, and uh, this is this is basically something that that's really reached the level of uh, going to to the front door of people. So it's not anymore which organization is is uh, uh, taking their fair share of the market, but rather rather that uh, people by their kitchen table, uh, parents talking to their children, uh, whether they should skip school or not. And even in, in, in Hungary, it's also um, what uh, the voice platform was connected to was a student, a student strike uh, that was actually um, uh, the students were motivated uh, by by uh, Fridays for Future, and they were taking steps toward um, uh, changing uh, the changing of the education system. There was a new law, and then they uh, when they saw what is happening with Fridays for Future, they said that okay, they we do not only have to act for the environment, but but uh, for for changing our school. So we see that there are changes we don't want, and and we will uh, go back. But I just wanted to also refer back to this uh, notion of uh, we were together for several months, and then uh, the climax of of campaigning is always yeah, it's it's changing. I I usually call it the uh, post concert post concert depression when we don't know how to go on uh, because it was so exciting for several hours or several days or several months uh, but I think this is this is somehow when you are forming a movement actually so when you find in your everyday life the place for that issue and this is this is what uh, digital organizing can help with because you can be present in in your members life in in your in your followers life this is something that they have to this is something that is called active participation when you when you actually can uh, show people how they change their own life for the sake of the issue and that's how students are actually uh, helping this issue because because it's so much present in their own family's life that not just they themselves but their parents and their uh, nephews and and their uncles and their grandparents are with them in this issue and of course they are making politicians angry as well because yeah of course as Radu said politi politicians of course, um, pay attention. If there are a lot of people on streets, in case of Hungary, there were um, a wave of demonstration that was so small that the maximum number of people who went on streets was 200. And uh, in, and even though that campaign could change um, uh, a law, basically, uh, it was um, a home care campaign when when families uh, providing care for their disabled and and terminally ill relatives, um, and uh, they didn't get the minimum wage in Hungary, and only those families went on, went on the street to the parliament continuously several times uh, within half a year, and there was so much tension around the topic that after half a year, uh, the parliament had to, had to issue a new regulation for the families. So I think it's not just the amount of people, but of course, uh, whether uh, that, that's also a question how essential the topic is that you are with, and and environmental topic is, is that essential that you have to take care about it. Is Romania? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, environmental activists are part of this protest because uh, the success of the protests in the last two or three years uh, also uh, um, lies in the fact that there are several layers of protests that overlapped. Uh, in 2012 to 2013, the first protest, the first major protest in Romania was exactly due to environmental causes. There is this, uh, one of the most important gold reserves in Romania is in a mountain called Roșia Montana. And there is uh, a gold corporation which wanted to exploit it with cyanides and, you know, to destroy actually the environment there. It was a huge protest. 
uh, two years afterwards, there was a protest for the healthcare system. There was a fire in a, in a club in Bucharest. 65 people died because the club was... Uh, the, um, it was not allowed to function, but corruption made it possible for it to function. Uh, corruption also made very inefficient the interve intervention of the emergency uh, uh, paramedics and so on. Corruption in hospitals, for example, in hospitals we discovered, I mean some journalists discovered, that they sold pure water as disinfectant, you know, and people died in hospitals because disinfectant was absent. And so on, it was, it was this kind of corruption in the healthcare systems that took into streets some other protesters. And in the protests starting 2017, all these groups of protesters, environmental activists, healthcare system protesters and so on, and some other people who have never been into the streets, united their forces and created this huge mass of protesters against the Social Democrat Party. So part of us are environmental activists, but we can see that, I mean, it was only something Priori prioritizing, you know. I mean, it was prioritary to stop them first because if they passed these laws which uh, eliminated crime fro from the penal system, Romania was not a governable country anymore. It would have been a jungle, actually. What's a country without a penal code? So we know that after solving this problem, we will turn our attention back to environment, back to healthcare, and so on. But it was a matter of priorities, not uh, so this is not, not either or, but let's unite, solve problems one by one. Um, Helena, you organized a conference, I think, in, uh, in September, uh, reaching out to, for example, um, trade unions uh, to enlarge the basis of your, your protests. And not just parents and scientists for future, you also reach out for other organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations, trade unions. Can you talk a bit about this? Yeah. Um, so the the motto of the September global climate tri strike in Germany was "Alle fürs Klima," so everyone for climate, and that was the point was kind of to touch on this aspect of the climate crisis will affect everyone sooner or later, no, much, no matter how much money they have or where they live or what they do, that the climate crisis will have effects on them and the point was kind of to to get all these people who are all going to be affected eventually or their children will be affected to basically unite and sh put pressure on governments because um, maybe in some aspects they seem more dangerous because they can vote. I mean, I'm 17, I cannot vote yet, but um, all the adults behind us are voting right now and are going to be voting in the next years. And I f think that um, causes um, politicians a lot more distress. But I was actually going to comment on two other aspects because you were talking about how um, politicians ig basically pretended to ignore the protests but acted. And I've kind of had the opposite experience because in the last month, so many politicians have told me how great I am and it's so horrible because they, they tell us, oh, what you're doing is so wonderful and you've inspired us and now we're going to enact legislation and we're so, we're so changed because of what you're doing and then they don't change anything. And that happens not just with politicians but also with bank executives. We go to, we were at the, um, the, the general meeting of Deutsche Bank and we told them, you're investing in coal and you're investing in, the, in, in destroying our future. And then the next, the answer of the of the of the um, CEO was, yes, I just wanted to tell you how great it is what you're doing and how you're inspiring a a a, a change in our society, and it's just it's kind of. Um, it's a huge problem because what do you, what do you say to that if you, if you keep getting poured over with compliments and and everyone telling you how wonderful you are without changing anything and uh, and that's kind of just kind of a, a barrier we've come up to again and again and there's the same thing when the when the Bundesregierung pres uh, presented their their climate plan that they they were saying how Fridays for Future had affected them so much and how they were going to actually follow through with the P Paris Climate Agreement and that just is not what factually happened. Um, just, uh, 
Just a quick note, there is this Climate Act in Parliament now, and there was a phrase in this uh, Article 9 saying that um, climate negotiations or deliberative process around the Climate Act should include uh, organizations like Greenpeace and others, but also citizens, Bürgerinnen und Bürger. And exactly this passage has been eliminated. And we're fighting now to get it back into the law. The Green Party is trying to to put it back into the proposition of the of the government. It's interesting that citizens, you are citizens, uh, eliminated after all these uh, these protests. I mean, we were talking, somebody brought up the, the, the phrase of permissive tolerance. Uh, uh, Herbert Marcuse said this, and the alternative was the große Weigerung. I don't know how to express this in, uh, in English. Große Weigerung means a great denial is... Uh, Rebuttal, yeah. So this was his answer to this uh, in, 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 in in '67. Nevertheless, I would like to ask you to. Um, um, many people uh, argue this is just a middle class thing what you're doing, and I know that, for example, in Hungary there is there are um, there are thoughts how to include trade unions, working class people into the alliance. Does this work? Um, well. I have to admit, it is a middle class thing that that these platforms are doing. So, uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say otherwise, uh, because how organizing is work, of course, um, like a, pla uh, a platform like the Voice, uh, uh, it's a micro funded. But for example, Campact, that we were talking about this uh, uh, pre uh, earlier, uh, when you when when the, when a platform when an organization is member funded, then of course there is uh, there is a pressure, there is a need. Uh, uh, to also pick topics that that are reflecting uh, the members uh, the members' needs and the and the members' point of view. So uh, there's when it comes to the next step uh, when when these platforms when these uh, movements can actually go to a next phase where they educate their members, when, where they educate uh, society. So can they risk educating? Can they, can they be the ones who are going to uh, confront people with, the, uh, with taboos, with, with the less com uh, comforting uh, topics? And, and of course, it's a, it's a really big question in, in Hungary. Uh, most of the topics that, uh, that I uh, was working with uh, are uh, basically representing um, um, marginalized uh, groups uh, in the last um, um, couple of um, years, uh, also connecting to cultural work as well, and um, and it's and it's pretty hard to to um, uh, go against the wall. Uh, that that uh, society that that between society and decision decision makers uh, have been have been built, but uh, but in several cases uh, we can see and uh, and and of course uh, Ahan could see and several movements in Hungary could see and, and I think also in Romania uh, and Poland uh, and Austria um, this is another uh, other case uh, how how can we reach out to to the marginalized groups to to organize themselves. But that's another kind of that's a, that's a new profession. That's another kind of uh, profession. So um, because there is not just the barrier of of the need to self-sustain an organization, but also the tools that these platforms are using are digital tools. So. Uh, you cannot say in Hungary that uh, 10 million people have laptops, mobile phones, and uh, and actually are are using them or or digitally active. So um, these these are these are taking times. These these uh, processing uh, processes uh, take decades in order to invite the whole uh, community within. Uh, but for example, the voice platform is is present in small communities as well. This is a combination. The method of, of the platform is a combination of digital organizing built on community organizing. And one of the first campaigns that I was working on was uh, was in uh, se uh, in um, uh, segregated settlements in Roma settlements in Hungary, and uh, we organized a "Don't Sell Your Vote" campaign, which basically was about um, um, the first democracy issue that was raised in in those communities. Uh, the only message uh, around the elections in two, not just in 2018 but before that in these communities is just one politician or one representative or not even a representative of, of a party appearing in the village and and uh, and asking people to sell their votes 
because uh, yeah, with 5,000 forints, which equals less than 10, uh, a bit more than 10 euros, uh, they can they can easily be bought out uh, in in such in such circumstances. It's, it's totally normal, and in this in this uh, campaign, we could see that going to the settlements, going to the villages, going to small uh, cities is uh, just the very first step and, and not in, in most of the cases and not even successfully uh, mobilizing for the opposition. And the first reason why we, uh, why we couldn't uh, successfully mobilize for the opposition is that people didn't know the opposition at all. So, for example, and this is, this is the media freedom issue in Hungary, that most of the people in the countryside couldn't even reach out to information that any other parties than Fidesz uh, uh, actually exist in Hungary. So, uh, the, comp so, so the more, we, more we enter the, uh, the, um, the bubble outside the middle class, outside in environmental issues outside uh, uh, issues uh, concerning whether uh, a better school uh, should be uh, uh, built or or should be preserve uh, some right, uh, some human rights or whatever infrastructural pro problems are also uh, the problems of the middle class then we enter a territory that is in in most cases in campaigning uh, is unknown, and then uh, there comes the uh, the relevance and the importance the importantness of uh, social work, and that is something that we also have to learn. And I myself also, and the platform also had to uh, work. Uh, um, and I am going to finish it right now because this is something that in Hungary the housing movement is really strong with. And uh, one of the successes in Budapest uh, basically was that a, a new mayor in the in one of the local mis uh, districts uh, was um, was um, a former, uh, uh, the campaign of the lo new local mayor was uh, run by a former uh, movement leader of the housing, uh, of the housing uh, movement, housing poverty, against housing poverty movement in Hungary. And this is a huge success for, for all the civil society organizations uh, uh, showing that that uh, civic participation is indeed needed in, in politics, and we have to be the ones who are not just confronting the politicians um, with with the issues, but who are also taking part in in politics in in an everyday level. And and the, and this glass box uh, feeling that you have with the banks is just basically a tactic that you can tackle if uh, if there are if you can uh, if you can activate more and and motivate and and mobilize more and more people who will come from them that we are not going to step into the, that glass box which is basically surrounded by your empathy and and uh, this kind of a uh, more and more uh, positive messages uh, by the way the chair is still empty so take Please take the opportunity to step in. Um, yeah, I feel engaged in this uh, discussion because I'm here as an, um, a magazine maker, but as a civilian, I happened to start an anti-austerity movement in Belgium five years ago. Uh, it's called, if I translate, um, heart above heart. So it's the heart, the human heart uh, against or above. That was already a discussion of uh, three hours if we would choose against or above. But and heart is like heart economics. Uh, it's against uh, neoliberal tendencies. And um, the main uh, idea of the movement was to link um, different protest movements. Um, so it's like trying to link, because we are all on our own island, let's say. It's the cultural sector on its own island. It's the, um, the health care at its own island. And what we have been trying is, is to link all that. Uh, the last five years, we had um, mass demonstrations. We had like more creative forms of action. Um, and because your first uh, question was like, what is the link between protest movements and uh, and political parties? Um, that's a big question. Uh, in in my experience, um, the link between protest movements and the institutions is even a more crucial question. I think. Um, because the political parties are, I don't know if. 
yeah, many people don't trust political parties anymore in a way. And, and these institutions, I think they have the key to, um, uh, to make it into a next step, what like the people on the streets are doing. Um, and that really depends on, on these, uh, yeah, institutions. It's, it's like, it's not, it, if the protest will work, it's not depending uh, on the activists, of course it is, but, but it's like depending of the whole circle around also. And uh, uh, yeah, sometimes you have good days and sometimes you have bad days when it comes to institutions who, who for them it's a difficult question, of course, like they are often depending on state subsidies, they, they want to have a, a kind of neutrality, but they also see that the quality of what they are doing uh, in hospital or in youth work or in anti-poverty is like, um, yeah, uh, not that good anymore as it, as it was before. And, uh, but the system is also really clever in reducing the time of all these institutions to to do to help like activists at the same time so it's um it's a difficult uh, thing in a way but we had we had good uh links with trade unions with, with which are quite strong still in in belgium and at the same time sometimes you feel that you become too dependent of the strategic uh, choices that for instance, straight unions are making, and, and I still, after five years, uh, we changed it a little bit into, maybe we, we need to talk again to, to just, yeah, uh, uh, human individuals, uh, like, yeah, and it's about the future, and, and um, yeah, so that is my thing I want to uh, put in here, it's the relation to institutions. Yeah. I think this is an important point, we should uh, still <coughs> discuss a bit more, uh, because uh, I, uh, I, I see, or sometimes in, in, in these protest movements, uh, a radical disappointment with parties, with parliaments, with the, with the institutions, and I think this is understandable, completely understandable, if you your reaction to or the reaction you experience with parties and 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 uh, yeah is, is, it goes in this direction but nevertheless uh, what we need is legislation what we need is regulation what we need is a, a tough institutional uh, intervention uh, because we don't have time <laughs> because we need uh, really strong measures and not just uh, transforming ourselves into climate, into sustainable uh, individuals. It's about the society in general. And so the, it's, it's very important. And I think uh, we have to do all, we have to engage all kinds of compromises to find a, a basis for common work with the institutions. I don't think that the anti-institutionalism of these movements will lead us very far. Um, do you agree, or is it uh, is there already a cleavage that is no longer to to, to transpass? Uh, I totally agree. We knew from the beginning that we have to transport the message into a partinical system, into a party system, to be uh, taken from. Part we didn't trust the parties, of course. We knew that they were untrustable, so we had to generate our own parties. Uh, in Romania, I mean. Now I mean only in Romania, but I think it can be exported as in most of the places on the earth. Uh, human nature is fallible by itself, Immanuel Kant said. Uh, so uh, we knew we had to generate our own parties. And uh, one of the big successes of the, of the protests was that in Romania, two new parties were generated from the streets. The Union Save Romania and PLUS. And their alliance now is the second force in Romanian politics and they will probably after the elections in 2020 they will be the first force so we generated our own our own parties uh, which are formed by people we know we have been working with we know no, we have known them from years uh, they have put pressure in the parliament uh, in uh, uh, on the social democrat party not to pass those laws that would have destroyed justice and thus uh, the street and the new parties together managed to keep the justice system functional until Liviu Dragnea, the head of the Social Democrat Party, 
has been condemned. He's in jail since May because we kept justice functional by generating our own parties with, with our own message and with our own program there. And I think this, uh, uh, I mean, of course we don't trust political parties, but that, that doesn't mean that we have to annihilate them. We have to build our own parties. You don't like something, do your own thing. So, Fridays for Future, do you trust the Green Party? The question was, do you trust the Greens? You don't have to answer yeah, if you don't like to. Excuse me? Um, I'm not going to answer the question, but I'll tell you some other stuff. Okay. Because um, Fridays for Future, I think, has been so successful because not, I mean, we didn't all go into the Green Party. I mean, I could have done that. I could have gone into the Green Youth Party and tried to, do some stuff there. But the whole point is that we need our whole spectrum. We need all the parties to do more climate because um, we, it won't be enough for, for one party to do that. It won't be enough for two. We need them all to somehow work together to secure our future. And we, we hear the same thing that we should just go create our own party and go into politics. But that's just not going to work because... Um, by the time the next elections are, that's going to be too late. And um, then would, we would have the problem again of getting the majorities. And so that's the, the whole kind of idea behind Fridays for Future is to, to have this protest movement outside of the parliaments to kind of lobby all of the parties into following our demands and working together to do this. Yeah. Um, somebody else who would like to raise his or her voice here. Thank you, sir. <laughs> somebody else who would like to step in here. Be courageous. This is fishbowl. Okay, here it is. Um, so my question to the Fridays for Future is, uh, your strategy of saying we just demand from the existing politicians that they make these changes, doesn't that require a certain minimum trust into them? Because if you know that, you're, uh, that the politician is absolutely not interested in listening to you and will put you just in jail and nothing else or something, then maybe the other tactic makes more sense. So doesn't that somehow imply that you have a certain trust in those politicians? And if you didn't have that trust, would you then not be forced to move to other tactics like uh, they, have, they are doing in, in uh, uh, Romania? And a question to you, a very tiny question. Just inform me. I have heard that the coalition of, of opposition forces also includes Jobbik. And uh, they have always present, been presented to us as right-wing extremist, almost fascist, uh, really ugly people. And I'm just wanting to hear your perspective on that, because I'm, I'm just curious. I, I cannot really make sense of that. <laughs> it feels weird. If, it feels weird if you're sitting behind me. Um, I think we don't. I don't think there's necessarily a trust in politicians. I think it's more a trust in our political system because up until I mean, I think our democracy is a little bit broken, and there are definitely some things that n need to change. Uh, but I think there's the general understanding that we can, within this political system, um, g gather enough pressure behind these politicians to, to do what they need to do and what their responsibility is and what they've been elected to do. Um, but I think that question is going to get more and more relevant the longer we protest and the less happens. And um, I think if you ask me that question again in a few months, I may have a different answer and maybe our tactic will have changed by then. Um, but I think um, for now, we don't really have another option because um, we need to, we, we were 
to really combat the climate crisis, we should have seen effective legislation last year and the year before and a few months ago, and that hasn't happened. And I think this extreme um, timely pressure just um, kind of um, gives us the, the, the need to try and solve this with the politicians that are in office right now and that are, uh, that are building the coalition right now. That makes sense. Yes, um, uh, I would I would first refer back to trust because I think that's a that's a really loose uh, kind of definition. Uh, I mean, um, define trust uh, in in terms of politics because uh, in a, and it it also refers to Jobbik as well uh, because this is I mean for for Ahang and and uh, for for the movements I think this is not a, uh, uh, politics should not be about trusts. I mean, uh, you cannot build a community. It's it's Political work is not about not about trust. It, it's about strategy, and it's of course it's also business. So uh, of course, leading a country is just like even more complex. So uh, I would say that if if a movement has a, a strategy, in order to find partners, in order to to make uh, the mission happen and find and can find partners uh, in in decision uh, or among decision makers, uh, that's another kind of issue than than trusting each other but uh, but building a kind of an uh, alliance uh, towards uh, fulfilling our goal um, and that's what uh, uh, and not just young uh, movement but also also other uh, movements from from the past had to face several times and we will have to face it because uh, and and this is this is I'm really sorry about it I'm, I mean it's a sad situation that uh, actually movements are not in a position that their voice can be heard heard uh, in the level of uh, decision-making processes, but they always have to take into consideration which alliances might work for them. So I think uh, people's voice uh, should be heard uh, in much uh, higher level than it is heard right now in, in Hungary or, or in other uh, countries in the region. Uh, and back to back to the question of Jobbik, uh, the, the platform, the voice platform, was organizing the primaries without Jobbik. So uh, it was like um, the first ever uh, institutional uh, change. It was a coalition of uh, the parties that actually uh, established a civic uh, program board for the primaries. So this, in this case, uh, avoiding the fact that uh, Jobbik is the far right. Uh, party in, in Hungary. So, uh, and they didn't have any nominees for for the opposition leader uh, for for Budapest because the whole is, uh, the whole notion of the primary uh, come to the table with uh, two um, nominees um, going for for um, the opposition uh, leader in Hungary and the the uh, so-called coalition of the opposition happened in several cases uh, in the countryside but not in Budapest. So Jobbik didn't uh, nominate them. Member in uh, uh, didn't uh, nominate um, uh, Lord Mayor for uh, Budapest, so they were um, in, in this sense uh, out of the game uh, for for this uh, kind of uh, um, establishing uh, process. Somebody else who would like to take this place? Black. We oui, here we are. This is living democracy. <laughs> Um, I would like to have a, have a question to Radu. Um, as far as I know, um, uh, Laura Kevesi is now appointed as the first European uh, general prosecutor fighting corruption uh, within the European Union, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, a bit an irony that the successful export of Romania is maybe the most powerful person now in Europe to fight corruption, which is super cool, I think. Uh, adding on this uh, discussion on institutions and, and corporations with institutions, do you and maybe all of you expect something from her that really helps you? Um, because we, we all know about the discussion that the European Union is sometimes powerless uh, and, and, and has no grip. Um, what, what will she do? What can she do? And are you, have you ever been in contact when she worked as a successful pro uh, prosecutor in Romania? Luckily, I was in contact with her, but not as a uh, guy charged with accusations, but uh, participating in discussions about the rule of law in Romania. And uh, 
uh, I met her twice, so uh, I know her very generally, but uh, I could feel that she's the person that she looks on TV. I mean, she's dedicated to her work, she has this ethical, strong ethical system and set of values, and she was probably the number one public enemy for the Social Democrat Party. She was incorruptible, she was very good. Under her mandate, two prime ministers were sentenced to jails, uh, a few dozens uh, parliamentaries and hundreds of mayors and so on. So they had their reasons to hate her. And uh, they made all the efforts possible to corrupt the constitutional court to, and to make, to make the constitutional court ask the Romanian president to remove her from office, which the president, after using all his constitutional weapons, was forced to do, even though he appreciated her. Uh, so now it's an irony, as you said, it's a, it's a strong irony that Europe uses her for this position, which is really strong, and I know what she can do because you asked about the well, concrete effects. I mean, it's very important that some, somebody knowing what white colors do, especially in Eastern Europe, for embezzling funds, and probably the tactics and the strategies for doing it are universal, knows exactly what to do in order to stop this. And it's about constructing hope, actually, because it's not only about a prosecutor. It's about constructing a, a legal system that pa uh, uh, punishes the evil guys, to put it plainly. So it's the hope that there is, there will be a Europe of justice. And it, uh, hope is crucial. Uh, I mean, we all talked about hope here. Constructing hope is it's our business. Uh, it's what protesters should do, it's what activists should do, it's what every one of us should do. Because uh, Leszek Kolakowski has this famous book, uh, The Hope of, uh, of the Hopelessness. When you're hopeless, but you still feel that there is some kind of small hope there, you go for it and you do every concrete actions that you can in order to achieve it. When we were in the streets in uh, the 31st of January 2017, before discovering that there is that 10-day buffer when we could act in order to keep Romania a rule of law, it was bitter, it was bitter hopelessness and still we were acting even though we thought that everything is lost. But then when we found out that there is a small hope that we can make things work, we started doing it, and we, we managed to do it. Now, Dragnea is in jail. Now, his party has lost, they, they, they had 47%, they are now at 22%. So they, they lost everything. Uh, Laura Kovic uh, has been kicked out, but now she's ruling anti-corruption in Europe. So you see, it's like a fairy tale, I'm sorry to say that. But uh, 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 yeah, uh, at least for, for Romania, it happened thus. Uh, we believed, we fought a few hundreds of days continually. I mean, three years being in the streets continually. We have lives, we are not hired to do that, you know. We have lives, we have jobs, we fought, and eventually it's exactly like what all Miss Universes say. If you believe hard enough in something, it will become true, you know. Yes, that's, that's really hard to say anything after that line. <laughs> no, I wish I was Miss Universe, yeah. Um, so uh, basically, I just wanted to refer back to hope uh, because I think it's really important because in most cases we are talking about sides, like the populists, the right-wing extremists, and uh, they are the bad guys, and, and the left, and, and the, uh, the liberals, and uh, oh, well, where are the conservatives, where is the center, and, and, and that's whatever. But I think hope lies within, within not taking sides, but within, within thinking about uh, society as a community. And I think that's really important to say in most of the cases where these movement, how these movements are fighting. Uh, because, uh, for example, in the case of Ohang, uh, we, could we could see that uh, in a lot of cases, um, the issue matters and not the political identity. And that was really important in the case of, the, for example, in the home care campaign, but also in the primaries as well, uh, because um, the right wing was, was uh, also uh, mobilizing as effectively as, as, the, as the leftist parties and, and, and anyone else. So making the issue as horizontal as possible uh, was effective enough to push back uh, politicians, to push back uh, decision makers, and say that change must happen. So where where hope lies, I think that's uh, I, I mean 
community is where hope lies and and um, restructuring and redefining values and and finding finding a com common identity is where hope lies basically uh, because um, if we are not uh, taking into consideration the other side then we are the ones who are building the wall more thicker and thicker in in most of the cases uh, which is which is really uh, uh, well funny to talk about uh, 30 years after after we are uh, talking about the fall of the wall but in in many cases we could see in the in the last 30 years that the that the wall became bigger and bigger uh, be, uh, between people uh, between uh, civil uh, society uh, i mean uh, civil actors and and everyday people so this is something uh, that we as activists have to tackle right now not to build it again uh, but to find ways um, i don't know uh, several ways around it Thanks. Who else want, would like to raise? Come on. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian. <laughs> I'm uh, uh, I'm from Ireland, and um, I'm active in the DM25 movement. Uh, if that might say something, like Democracy in Europe 2025. So we're interested in building uh, the demos of Europe and we're here Europeans talking to each other about our experiences in activism and in Europeans what do you think Europeans can do to support your movements and support each other's movements really across borders like things like just um, helping to wage inv information wars online or or something something else and um, also I'd, I'd like to also make a point about in maybe inviting Friday's future to work for because work for more Europe uh, solutions to the climate crisis on a European level, and um, yeah. So I'm curious to hear what you think about all those things. Um, yeah, I think that's really important, especially because we have an institution as the European Union, and we can obviously also fight for solutions on that higher level, which we actually trying to do a little bit right now. Um, I don't know if, if you know about the decision of the European Investment Bank who um, wanted to who want to stop investing in fossil fuels and fossil industries. And Germany actually with they have the highest percent like um, because it's it's weighted by um, how much industry you have. And um, Germany has like the the, the the biggest part biggest stake of votes exactly. And they they were basically going against this decision because they said we need to continue investing in gas, which is a fossil fuel and not uh, a renewable energy as the gas industry likes us to think a lot of times. And um, I think that's where we can really, as maybe a, a national movement, also lobby basically these decision makers in Germany who can then uh, maybe change their decision on a European level. Um, yeah, I think uh, you you put the question of support. And I think the, the biggest way we can just support each other is to talk like we're doing now. I think that's really important that we, because all these different aspects are all combined somehow. I mean, um, movements for social equality are intertwined in so many places with the movements for, for climate justice and for um, uh, against corruption. I mean, it's all basically um, connected in so many places. And I think, so that's what we can, most important thing we can do is talk to one another. And um, the second most important thing I think everyone can do is to vote and to be politically active and to take part in democracy, even if maybe it's not perfect. And um, I think we did that really successfully before the European elections where we did um, the, uh, uh, like basically strikes all over Europe um, the day before the European elections, which um, climate was in the end the biggest and most important issue in the European elections, so that was quite successful in that way. Um, I have a question to you, because you're coming from Ireland, uh, and I think Ireland has something to export uh, to the European Union, so to the Euro Europeans, this is a citizen assembly. I think this is a, a, a brilliant model for deliberative and consultative democracy, uh, changing even laws as it was, uh, as it was shown in, in, in Ireland. Maybe you can talk a little bit about this, and I just want to mention that 
In this regard, uh, the French president has um, established uh, 150 uh, climate conventions all over the country to discuss climate change and climate uh, protection measures, uh, the law, the, the, the acts in France. Uh, and this is a, a kind of, uh, <laughs> by the, these uh, councils are uh, established by a random vote. So it's everybody who participates. It's a very representative uh, convention. And I think this is interesting uh, that uh, we always hear that climate change and the problem will diminish democracy or will fight democracy. No, the, 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 the opposite is true. Um, the, the climate action and democratization can go together. And this is what can be shown with institutions. Like, would, would you like to explain a bit about Citizens' Assembly in, in Ireland? Yes, I think it was quite a good idea. Um, the most dramatic, the most well-known consequence of the citizens' assemblies in Ireland have have was the uh, referendum to change the constitution to permit abortion, which was passed surprisingly last year by a two-thirds majority, and that that was the result of this citizens' assembly being given the task by the government to decide what to do about abortion because it had been. Uh, it has been banned in Ireland for yeah forever, and uh, or since the 1870s, and then it was put into back in the days when Ireland was a much more Catholic country. It was put into the constitution. The ban was put into the constitution in 1983 by referendum, but it's it's been like a political uh, hot potato uh, ever since then, and especially in recent years with the rising feminist movement. So. I think the government didn't really want to deal with it itself. So they gave it to this citizens' assembly and they gave four, gave them four other issues as well. And yeah, the citizens' assembly recommended that they ha have a referendum about repealing this because it had been more than a generation had passed since then. So yeah, it's, it's quite a good idea and you can read about it in detail and there's a website, it's citizensassembly.ie, it's in English. Um, or Irish, if you want. <laughs> so, yeah, you could. I I don't know all of the details, but that website has all the details. It's it's not it's not active anymore, though. But yeah, I think these such citizen assemblies are a very positive step. That's what we need more of them, like for in the case of climate, so that people can talk about, like get get into more extensive dialogue with each other than just complaining about how trains are more expensive than flights or how. Or like putting lots of other random issues into it, like too many coffee cups or something. <laughs> Wells would like to step in here, to sit down on the black chair. Cute. Um, yeah, I would like to ask the question: um, How can we show that all these problems, ecological and social institutional problems, belong together? How can we create a common utopia? because I'm afraid um, that these problems or issues are played against each other. I think we saw that in Turing a, li a little bit. And I'm afraid that when the uh, movements um, are disappointed, and, and the Klima Paket was a huge disappointment for this movement, um, that they become radicalized and that we could uh, see the point where we ask the question, if democracy is not able to um, save the climate, who will? And we, we dis discussed this a little bit. And um, yes, yeah, so to be precise, Roger Hallam, Extinction Rebellion, is uh, asking this question a little bit right now. So we should have an answer to that, and we should have an, maybe an utopia to that, that everybody, so also the social weak, I don't know if this is the correct <laughs> term, but... Um, can see that uh, a green future and ecological future is uh, a good f future for everybody. Elena, we were talking about the Green New Deal. I mean, this yeah. is maybe the, the word. Yeah, I think but answering your question, the best thing we can do is to share our visions and to basically just talk about what is possible and the changes that we can make. And I feel like if we talk about things like um, free public transport, that's a thing that's going to benefit a lot of people who maybe don't earn as much money and who cannot 
maybe pay for it. And if we talk about the possibilities for creating jobs, creating green jobs and investing into renewable energies, and that obviously also um, helping people. And I think um, a Green New Deal, obviously, is which is being talked a lot about by AOC in the US, but also in England, is um, a huge possibility to um, basically connect um, fixing the climate crisis with fixing a lot of the social problems that we have. And um, this, uh, this is always being played out against each other, saying we can't put too high of a carbon tax because that will um, be bad for the people is just, I mean, that's not the truth because we had multiple studies on carbon taxing showing that it's actually a very social way of fighting the climate crisis and that it can be done in a way that helps basically people but it's not, that's not the way it was implemented and that's the problem because the way that the climate packet is now is that it is is um is a, is, is a burden for the lower class people and people who are earning less. And that's exactly what it shouldn't be. And um, that's exactly what our government is denying. They're, they're saying we had to have this low carbon price because we, we don't want to be too much of a burden on people. And that's, I mean, that's just not the, the truth. That's not reality because it is a burden on people the way it has been done right now. And that's just kind of horrible because it's just a, an excuse for not acting enough and it's not really yeah <laughs> I'm just so it annoys me so much that I don't really even know what to say because it seems like it this should not be something we have to talk about uh, yeah actually I think uh, what we have to do depends on our representation on Europe and for me there was this discussion with the nation states before. Um, Max Weber famously defined a nation as a community of memory and feeling. And I think this is what happens here now, talking with each other about our different problems, environmental things, healthcare, protests for corruption and so on, I mean anti-corruption. We are creating this community of memory and feeling where we all participate and which we all share and we behave like a nation like a European nation, if you want to, even though we belong to different nation states with different problems. So talking, uh, as Helena said, I mean, it's, it's more than talking. It's creating this community of memory and a feeling which is vital if we want to have a Europe. And then we have to create alliances like they did in Hungary. And it was, a, I mean, the, the alliance in Budapest is really important and inspirational for uh, what we will have in Bucharest uh, uh, running for mayor. We have to create alliances even though, and this is also a, a sort of answer for you, even if we don't like some actors uh, in that alliance. Uh, I have seen something impressive in Turkey this year. I have been there 10 days after the first row of elections for, for mayors in Istanbul. And it was an alliance which was theoretically outrageous for them. It was, on the one hand, socialists allying with nationalists with, who hate their guts. There is a huge ideological tension between them. And they also allied with the Kurdish party. There is a tension resulted from blood. I mean, there have been, you know, killings from both sides. I mean, from the th all, three, all three sides. So they had to build an alliance which is also tensioned by blood memories in order to stop a dictator. So now I think the, the radical divide is not anymore between the right and the left as it used to be. It's between uh, philo-totalitarian or anti-totalitarian. This is where the radical divides pass. I, we have to accept the anti-totalitarian axiom and to function on this one and build alliances which help us place ourselves and our politics into the philo-democratic and anti-totalitarian movement, even if sometimes we have to use, we have sometimes to use immoral solutions for that, like Jobbik is, an, is a part of an immoral solution. But it's still a solution that helps your country remain a democracy. And this is vital uh, today. And um, just to what can we do as, as what can we learn from each other? The, just in one sentence, uh, my message would be copy, paste and translate because there is no harm in trying. That's that's the I, I know that it's just like a stereotype, 
typical question or or, or, or sentence. But uh, for for a movement like like uh, what I was working with uh, several times in in Hungary, this is this this is the same. Uh, there, th this is a common mistake that we think that we have to start from scratch, and that's not true. We have a lot of examples. There are, you know, it's just like uh, libraries with books uh, with examples uh, written and and tried out, and and you never know which is going to uh, click in the right moment for you. So there is not. I mean, you can predict. This is this is my prediction to predict what is going to uh, work. But on the other hand, uh, using your uh, using other examples that are on the table is really important. And and platforms like like Ahang and Impact and 38 Degrees and Move On and, and so on and so forth and Fridays for Future are doing the same. That they have models uh, and they are trying it out. Uh, there are messages that we are using, and sometimes it's, it's working and sometimes it's not. So. I think uh, if you have 100 message, then then two of them is going to work. But you don't have to worry about uh, that you are not going to have the right tool in your hand. You have it. It's just a matter of time until it's going to work for you. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think we have to stop here. I, it was a wonderful evening about hope. Uh, I think uh, this worked well. Uh, you see three examples, wonderful examples of fighting for the right cause. Uh, and uh, a fourth one, um, and um, um, it it gives me an opportunity for a personal note. Uh, sometimes people like me are asked to step back as a white old man, uh, so I do this, and I'm quite confident that others are able to continue the fight, and let's go on. Thanks. Thank